Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to our Silicon Dragon show. And my name is Rebecca Fannin. I'm the founder, editor, author, and online host. And our website, in case you want to check it out, is SiliconDragonVentures.com. Thanks for joining us today. And please start getting your questions warmed up for Eric Fang, who's on the waiting list right now for your questions. Uh, you can see him over here in our little box, our little cube on Zoom here. So hi, Eric. How's it going? It's going great. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Yeah, no, no problem. Well, you are a man of action. I, I think uh, you're just everywhere these days with your new Gold House Ventures and uh, also your new startup. Um, but I, there's no way I can beat you with all my little uh, bells and whistles here. But I do have my videos and my events and my Ask a VC Anything Online series and four books and a newsletter and our membership program. So we have all that going and um, got, uh, yeah, four books. A recent one was Silicon Heartland. It came out this year uh, from Rust Belt to Tech Belt. So talking about areas outside of Silicon Valley that are developing with their own tech specialization uh, from Pittsburgh to Cincinnati to Dayton to Cleveland to Columbus uh, and uh, the Heartland. Uh, so I've been driving around the heartland quite a bit recently, not flying so much, but uh, next week I'll be in Hong Kong on my first trip back to Hong Kong since COVID. And I'm really looking forward to that. So, okay, now, uh, okay, here's the little crib sheet about Eric. And uh, Eric, why don't you walk us through this? There's some things here that really stand out in my mind. Uh, first of all, what you're doing currently with Gold House Ventures but we'll get to that in a minute. But I want to get into a little bit more about how you got to this point in your career. So I noticed the University of Texas at Austin, engineering, and then Microsoft. And then take us through this. Um, take us through this, Eric. Yeah, I, I, I'm a, a product and engineering person by trade. Uh, love technology, love writing code, try to do it every day. Uh, cut my teeth uh, and got my career going at Microsoft. Uh, uh, worked in a variety of product groups, but spent most of my time in research. So doing uh, computer vision and AI research at Microsoft, both in the uh, Redmond Research Lab, but also the Beijing Research Lab. Uh, so I got to live in China for three years, uh, doing uh, a lot of fundamental research out there. Um, had the fortune to be able to start a company, uh, actually started it in Beijing. Um, and that company uh, called Mojiti was acquired by Hulu in 2007. And that's what brought me back to the States. So from 07 on, I've been back in the States. Uh, I was the first CTO and head of product at Hulu, got to build that business up from, you know, zero to um, when I left, it was, you know, 500 people uh, doing hundreds of millions of revenue uh, a year. And, you know, we probably had 50 million users. Um, and in 2010, that's when I started off on a, a new career uh, and uh, joined Kleiner Perkins. And I was there for about nine years in a bunch of different roles. Uh, I had the fortune of getting to work with Al Gore on the clean tech practice. I helped start the growth fund with Mary Meeker. Um, I uh, spent uh, a couple of tours of duty through some of our portfolio companies, um, helping to run engineering at those uh, at those companies. But I spent most of my time at Kleiner uh, as a general partner running our uh, early stage consumer investing practice. And then um, in 2019, one of my portfolio companies uh, was acquired by Facebook uh, and uh, Facebook invited me to come and run the team post acquisition. I thought it was a really exciting opportunity. It ended up being in the uh, video e-commerce space. So uh, ran Facebook live shopping as well as uh, commerce incubations uh, at Facebook and had an amazing time there. But um, uh, I ultimately uh, at my core, I'm an entrepreneur and also an aspiring investor as well. So uh, wanted to go back and uh, focus on those two things. So last year uh, started uh, both uh, a new fund called Gold House Ventures, as well as a new crypto company called Symbol. So um, have been uh, uh, exciting to be a founder of both those uh, 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 projects. Uh, it's been a crazy ride full of fun stories. Uh, and, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully they'll have good endings at the end, but uh, we're still <laughs> okay. kind of the story's being written, but uh, we're having fun along the way. Okay. I remember uh, we met up in Shanghai when you were at Flipboard and uh, you were on stage there. I remember uh, it very well. Uh, and wow. uh, we were at the Marriott in, uh, in, in Shanghai. Beijing. Yeah. Oh, in Shanghai. That's right. Yeah. 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 So uh, anyhow, uh, history, 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 and now the future. <laughs> That's with Gold House Ventures and this great looking crew of people that you have assembled 
uh, for Gold House Ventures. So tell us about Gold House Ventures and tell us who all of these people are as well. I know I recognize uh, Eric, of course. Ah, <laughs> I'm the least distinguished one uh, in that group. But yeah, um, well, Gold House Ventures, uh, it has to start with Gold House itself. So Gold House is a nonprofit that was uh, first uh, uh, started in 2016. Uh, and the mission of Gold House was to create an organization that can unite the Asian and Pacific Islander diaspora in this country uh, in order for us to be able to support one another, help one another, and promote uh, what we call unity, success, and representation. Those are the three things that we want to champion for our community. Um, and we have, uh, at this point, uh, over 5,000 members inside the Gold House uh, uh, nonprofit, our collective, uh, folks like uh, Simu Lu, uh, John M. Chu, who's the director of Crazy Rich Asians, Simu Lu, of course, Shang-Chi, uh, Ronnie Chang, uh, Aquafina, Padma Lakshmi uh, on the media side, um, great um, entrepreneurs and founders like Kevin Lin of Twitch, who's the uh, dashing gentleman in the center of that photo, uh, Steve Chen, the founder of YouTube, um, Tony Shu, the founder of DoorDash, like just great entrepreneurs and, mem and, and investors as well. So our friend Hans Tung uh, from GGV, who was kind enough to introduce us as a uh, one of the early members of the Gold House nonprofit as well. And, and again, our, our mission is to help one another, support one another, and really uplift our community. Um, one of the programs that the nonprofit was running was an accelerator. Um, it was modeled after Y Combinator. So we did two cohorts a year. Each cohort had about eight to 10 companies in it. And we would mentor them through a 12-week program and then help them raise capital. And we did it entirely pro bono. Uh, we just did it, again, as a way to support our community. And we would get phenomenal investor mentors like Jeremy Liu of Lightspeed and Aileen Lee of Cowboy to come and mentor our um, our entrepreneurs inside that program. And uh, we would then uh, put them through you know a demo day and, and run a lot of the same things that Y Combinator does, but specifically target at Asian and Pacific Islander founders. Um, and we did this program entirely pro bono, just again, to support our community. And in um, 2021, we are looking at the results of the, uh, of the accelerator. We had been running it for about three years at that time. And we realized that, man, the companies are doing really well. Uh, at that point, they had gone on to raise over 500 million of follow-on capital. At this stage, they've raised over a billion. Um, we had several unicorns that had gone through the accelerator, folks like Aura Ring. They make a, um, a fitness tracking ring. Uh, Clipboard Health, that's in the uh, uh, digital health space. Um, like really successful companies. And uh, uh, the uh, my 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 uh, my colleagues at Gold House, the, the nonprofit, we were kind of kicking ourselves saying, man, it would have been nice if we had invested in some of these companies through the accelerator. So that was the first um, uh, uh, inspiration for wanting to create this fund because we just had terrific uh, access uh, to uh, Asian entrepreneurs and founders and a great brand and sort of a mission that uh, that it appealed to them and they wanted to work with us. So um, we decided to, to put that mission to the test and build a fund around that. So we launched Gold House Ventures um, last spring and um, uh, raised a $30 million debut fund. And our LPs are all members of the Gold House nonprofit collective. It is folks like Tony Shu from DoorDash and Ken Lin from Credit Karma and George Yuan from Honey and Steve Chen. And you mentioned a, a few of those like Nathan Chen, Olympic figure skater, Apollo Ono, another Olympian. These are all the, our LPs, the ones that have entrusted us with their capital. And um, What's exciting about this fund is the way that we've structured it, it's actually owned by the nonprofit. So um, all the fees and carries go back to the nonprofit. Our mission and, and sort of, I should say, our vision for the Gold House Ventures Fund is to act a lot like a university endowment. We want it to be kind of like the Stanford or the Harvard or one of these awesome, amazing, high-performing endowments that provide funding for the university um, and a lot of the capital is from the alumni or the members of um, of the uh, of the university. For us, it's the members of the nonprofit or our LP base. But the one difference is that we also want to make it a for-profit initiative for LPs. So imagine if you could kind of, as a Stanford alum, could just put money into the Stanford endowment, take it out, make a profit off of that too. But then the profit that the general partners, the investors made would go and fund um, great uh, um, uh, uh, a sort of... Uh, uh, community work for the university. That's the mission for Gold House. It's a dual purpose where we uh, want it to be a for-profit initiative for our LPs so that they can make a great return on their capital. But uh, we also want to generate uh, proceeds for the nonprofit so that we can invest and do great work for our community. So we like to tell our LPs, 
we like to make you money, but we also want you to feel good about it at the same time. And the reason uh, we set that up is we depend on our LPs to hold us accountable to ge generate great returns. We can't, we did not ask for a donation. In fact, many of them wanted to donate to the nonprofit. We were like, no, we, we're not looking for a donation. What we're looking for is a commitment that you believe in our strategy around unity, success, and representation for our community. And therefore, we only benefit if the fund does well, if you benefit, because we're not here to prove that Asians make failing companies that depend on a donation to be subsidized. We're here to prove that the API community can create iconic companies like DoorDash and YouTube and Credit Karma and Honey and these amazing companies. Um, and we want to just be a part of their journey so that as they become successful, our fund becomes successful and that proceeds, the profits from our investments can go and fuel work that uplifts our community. So it's very much this virtuous cycle that we are trying to create here. So again, it's not a donation by LPs. It's very much a for-profit initiative for them. And um, so far, the results have been um, been really strong. So um, we've uh, deployed about 40% of the fund. Um, we're in 68 uh, company. Actually, at this point, we're in 74 companies. But um, we are in a lot of phenomenal investments. We, we get to co-invest with the top uh, firms around the, the valley, like uh, A16Z and Sequoia and Kleiner and Lightspeed. Uh, those are some of our co-investors. And the exciting thing is that we get invited into deals um, because our members um, are general partners and great investors at these other funds. You know, uh, Hans Tung, for example, he's not only an LP in our fund, he's part of the Gold House Network. So when he does deals, he's excited to share those deals with the nonprofit. Uh, so we sit at this very interesting position where uh, we just get preferential access to this great network of uh, of deal flow because of the mission of Gold House. So that's really exciting. And um, the other thing too that is proven out with this fund is I just fundamentally believe that right now the biggest uh, limitation, the kind of the biggest constraint in venture investing, is access to deals. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, it might have been about awareness of deals because, you know, information didn't travel as quickly and you might hear about something early and be able to jump on it and, you know, kind of have this proprietary relationship that no one else knows about. Therefore, you can invest. Those days are gone. Like every deal everyone knows about. Everyone's talked about it. It gets shared on social. Uh, you know, information travels so quickly that awareness is now commoditized. Everyone knows when there's a hot deal happening. Um, the question, though, is access. Who gets access? access? Who gets to win the and right to invest in that amazing opportunity? Who gets an allocation in the round? Access is the constraint. And there are a couple ways to get access. One, um, you can you can buy your way to access. You can um, overpay, uh, you know, offer, you know, sort of uh, crazy terms and the biggest possible check and kind of buy your way into access. And we've seen some funds do that, um, particularly some of the crossover funds entering into early stage uh, venture. But it's hard to build a portfolio when your strategy is to overpay. It's just it's just hard to build a successful portfolio. So that's one way, but I don't I don't recommend it. Um, another way is around um, pedigree and reputation. Um, you know, a lot of people want to work with the Kleiners and Sequoias of the world because um, of their storied history, and they want to be associated with that brand. And I, I put Y Combinator in that 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 uh, story ground as well in terms of just like super pedigreed firms that people just are willing to, to do whatever it takes to work with them because of their reputation. Um, that's a great way that works, but that takes decades often to build up that level of rep reputation. So for new emerging funds, what I believe and what we believe at Gold House Ventures is the way to win access into deals is through affinity, is to really resonate with the entrepreneurs and the other investors on the, uh, on the cap table so that you get invited into deals. And uh, uh, the perfect example of affinity uh, is actually what a lot of the celebrity-led venture funds have been doing. Folks like Sound Ventures, that's Ashton's fund, and Marcy Gray, that's Jay-Z's fund, and Mantis Capital, that's the Chain Smokers fund. But these celebrity funds um, have such amazing uh, uh, deal flow and access to great companies because entrepreneurs, investors just want to be associated with them. They have a, a personal passion for those celebrities. And I, I remember back in my Kleiner days, we often... Kind of were initially dismissive of some of these celebrity funds, like ah, you know, Ashton's not that serious. Like you know, he's busy making movies. What does he know about venture? Like what? Well, you know, it's 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 just like a passing thing. And then we realized that, wow, um, 
Ashton gets into any deal he wants. He can come in late in the process. He gets any allocation he asks for. Um, we get elbowed out of deals because the entrepreneur wants to make room for Ashton and sound. Actually, what he has is a super interesting platform. Um, so affinity, I think, is really strong uh, in terms of a way to win access to deals. And for us, that's that's the model of Gold House Ventures. We have affinity uh, because of the mission of the Gold House nonprofit. And our affinity is around one very specific type of investment opportunities. And those are companies founded by Asian and Pacific Islander entrepreneurs. So, um, you know, if we were going to uh, another type of entrepreneur, you know, let's say we went to a great Hispanic entrepreneur, he might think that we're an interesting fund, but it's unlikely that they would have the same level of affinity. Um, but when we go to one that's founded by uh, like a, a Chinese American like myself, um, and I, we can talk about uh, shared journey, what the shared experience growing up, shared experience sort of pitching to um, investors and them not understanding what we're trying to communicate. And um, that that shared experience, um, it just creates affinity and they end up loving um, what we represent in the mission of Gold House. And all of a sudden we get access to those deals. So um, this um, idea of backing API founders is not only something that we're passionate about because it's we want to promote representation diversity, but we also think it's a great asset class, like a lot of great unicorns and IPO companies, a disproportional amount have been founded by uh, Asian and Pacific Islander founders. Uh, and then finally, we get access to those deals um, because of the mission of Gold House. So all those three things have come together to form what I think is a really unique investment strategy that um, we're super excited to put forth. And, um, and so far, uh, it's been about 18 months into the fund and, and things are looking really good. Yeah, it sounds like fun too, maybe on the way. <laughs> let's hope. Let's hope. Yeah, I think uh, uh, when you ask a fund manager, you know, the, the joke is like, what's your goal for fund one? And it's always to raise fund two. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, I heard that. Well, you know, it definitely seems like you're in, in the right area. Looking at these stats here, 41 of the top VCs, um, you know, have are of Asian descent. 26% of you, 26% of unicorns have an Asian founder. And um, yeah, it, it's an amazing to see the success of Asian American entrepreneurs and investors uh, in the U.S. And you're investing primarily in the U.S., right? That's right. About 90 plus percent of our deals, might be maybe 95 percent of our deals are U.S. focused. We have a handful of investments international in uh, Indonesia, Singapore, sort of the Southeast Asia region. Uh, and it, it just so happens that that's one that we have some pretty strong ties to. So, uh, you know, folks like the Hartona family in Malaysia, they are LPs in the fund. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Ronnie Chang, uh, the phenomenal comedian who has very deep ties to Southeast Asia as an LP in the fund. So because of that, we, we have some interesting access uh, that I, I think we will continue to uh, to look at. And we think there's going to be some great companies there. But for the most part, our our, our strength remains in the U.S. OK, yeah, uh, you just reminded me that we just had on Helen Wong, who is ex-GDV and ex-Cheeming Ventures, who used yeah. to be in Shanghai. And I'm sure you know her well. Of course. Uh, she's on the show from Singapore and investing in Southeast Asia now with AC Ventures. So a lot of changes going on and it's great to see all these young faces, good looking group here. And uh, I'm sure uh, everyone wants to hear about your portfolio, who, what you're investing is as well. Uh, but also I'd like to see um, who has a question. So there is somebody here, Jeff Bennett. Um, and thank you everyone for asking great questions. We'll give an, a, an award at the end of the show to the best question. Uh, but uh, anyhow, are there any areas that you don't invest in? Uh, Jeff Bennett wants to know. And uh, you can read the rest of his uh, comment here. Um, and because he has a specific company that he's asking yes. about too. Uh, so yeah, uh, are there any areas that you don't invest in? You know, um, we... We operate like a traditional um, venture uh, institutional fund in that we look for technology enabled businesses that uh, can be valued um, uh, at uh, software multiples. So uh, that's that's really the the mandate of uh, of the fund. So uh, physical goods, um, sort of service companies, um, while they can be great businesses, they typically don't get software type multiples uh, on their valuation. So, those are the ones that are um, off spec. But um, in terms of this specific company, um, oh, actually anyone that's on the um, 
that's on the call uh, here. Uh, if you're ever interested in, in, in pitching Goldhouse Ventures, you can just uh, email investments at goldhouse.org. Uh, that's, that's, that'll get to all the partners. We always uh, monitor that, that list and are always looking for, um, for pitches. Um, again, we do have a requirement that uh, there is one Asian or Pacific Islander founder because, you know, again, one of our priorities is to promote representation uh, amongst the entrepreneurial community. So we do that by you know, insisting that we have a diverse founding team and of every investment that we make. So that is a requirement. But other than that, um, we evaluate uh, those companies that have at least one uh, API founder in the exact same way that a Kleiner or Sequoia or Excel or, you know, a Lightspeed would, which is um, um, software enabled businesses that can um, be transformed by technology and get sort of um, uh, the mm -hmm. technology slash software multiples evaluation. Um, in terms of the specific company, uh, my advice is, um, to, to really, I, I think uh, this is one that you'll probably have to just educate people on uh, the market and the TAM um, in terms of like sexual health, um, the spend involved. It may not be one that's top of mind to folks. Um, and I, I find that there's a lot of uh, sort of alternative categories, whether it's like, you know, we, we have in our portfolio a, a really amazing company that, uh, that works in the construction space. And it's just not one that I think a lot of investors know about. So that company, they just have to spend time educating people on the market and how exciting an opportunity is. So that would be my advice to you. I, I suspect that you'll run into uh, investors that just don't know much about the market. So uh, when that's the case, the 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 uh, uh, sort of the responsibility now shifts you to to make sure that you're spending enough time educating them on the market, how exciting it is. There's a lot of spend. There's a lot of growth opportunity, um, and and make sure they understand that so that uh, the the investor can make an informed decision. Right. And you're uh, also being able to select from those who are part of your membership network or those who have already gone through your accelerator program. That's right. So do they get preference? Um, yeah. So uh, everything is still an independent investment decision, you know, that's sort of like, um, but uh, I would say that um, we definitely get to spend more time with them, which is exciting. And that often uh, leads to better investment outcomes. Uh, I remember actually, uh, I'm going to credit our, our good friends at GGV Capital. Uh, uh, you mentioned Hans Tung earlier. Um, yeah. They shared with me this study that they did early on where they tracked um, investments they made and they mapped it to um, the length of time they knew the entrepreneur. Uh, you know, might have been oh. somebody they had met in like a previous company and had been tracking mm -hmm. for a while and they had the, uh, investing. And they found that the success, likelihood of success and the length of time that they had known the entrepreneur were directly correlated. Longer they knew the entrepreneur, better the investment was. It was just like mathematically, statistically, absolutely correlated. Um, so um, I think that that's one of the benefits of having this Gold House Collective. We run our accelerator. It just gives us an opportunity to learn and spend time and develop a relationship with entrepreneurs more than uh, sort of just an investment off the street that you know we're, we're only getting to learn over the course of a month diligence process. Whereas with the accelerator, it's like 12 weeks of, very intense collaboration with our membership network. Some of the entrepreneurs we've known for years. So um, that that's really exciting. I think it helps us make better investment decisions when they ultimately go off and uh, start new companies. Is that accelerator program online or is it in person? Um, it is online. It's remote. We've got people all over, but we also make sure that we do a number of in-person events. So we always do like a, you know, like a kickoff dinner. We do a couple of networking events and then we have like a, a <laughs> We call it a soiree, but it's like a fancy demo day where we get everyone together. Uh, we bring a bunch of investors and LPs in to meet them. Um, and then we also actually do an, an online uh, demo day pitch session as well. So it's kind of a hybrid um, where we give the companies an opportunity to, uh, to do things in person. But for those that, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to make it geographically, um, you can go through the program entirely online. Okay. Uh, so there's another question here from uh, Phil Tran. He's uh, thinking about or planning about raising uh, some more money. And he wants to know how to go about it, uh, you know, choosing the best deal, getting the best valuation, yeah. uh, minimizing dilution. These are all the big questions that founders face when they are raising money. Of course. So um, I think the best way to approach that question is to first talk a little bit about the current macro, because it is a mm -hmm. weird time right now, as, as you mm -hmm. know, Rebecca, and as, as a lot of folks on the call and have I'm sure experience. It's just a weird time. Um, so I'll, let me first comment a little bit about the macro. 
um, it is improving. So at the beginning of the year, it was like pens down, nothing was getting done. People were uh -huh. just like in survival mode, trying to understand the volatility and the, 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 the extreme uncertainty about interest rates. It just led everyone to be like, I, I, it's too volatile now to make a decision. So no deals were getting done. Now that we have a little bit more stability with the macro, uh, especially around interest rates, um, deals are finally getting done. You know, as, as LPs often tell me, um, you know, life is easier in a low interest rate environment, but even in a high interest rate environment, we can operate. The way that the, the environment we can operate in is complete uncertainty. So we first and foremost, we need certainty. And now that we have a little bit more certainty, um, there is operations happening on the financing side and deals are finally getting done, which is exciting. Uh, I would say that the there's more early stage deals happening than late stage. Late is the one that is still the hardest. And I think what's challenging for late stage is that a lot of the companies raised a lot of capital, late stage growth companies. They raised a lot of capital in 2021, 2020, 21, 22 at very favorable terms. Um, you know, 100, 200 X Ford multiples uh, was common. Um, and uh, they still have that capital in place. And um, when that capital runs out, they'll likely come out to market and they'll reprice in terms of better, more sane multiples. Instead of paying 200X, you might pay 8X. Uh, and I think a lot of the growth funds are waiting for that repricing event before they really deploy. Uh, so the growth markets are still a bit stagnant as they wait for the companies and their previous rounds that were raised at like peak valuations in 21 to run out. So next year, I expect that the growth markets will sort of thaw and there'll be more growth rounds getting done. But right now, there are a lot of um, early stage rounds getting done. Um, so that's good. And I think that will improve for even further next year. Um, so that's okay. one context to add. Another one I'll add is right now, um, the valuations for early stage are pretty stable. Um, you know, it's not like, you know, a, a company was valued at, you know, 20 million um, uh, two years ago. And now it's that same sort of stage company is getting valued at 5 million. You know, it's not, it's not huge discounts. And the biggest reason is at the early stage, um, most of those outcomes are binary. It's sort of uh, this company and this investment will be a great one, uh, almost independent of price. Um, it, it, it's very rarely the case where, hey, I, I could have invested at Facebook at... Um, 15 million valuation, that was a great deal. But at um, 18 million, it's a, it's a bad deal. And at 12 million, it's a fantastic deal. Like you just don't have that level of precision. It's sort of like it works or it doesn't. So because of that, we are seeing not only deals getting done uh, at the early stage, but valuations, you know, pretty comparable to years past. It's, it's, it's not a huge haircut. So that's also, those two things that I think are very good for entrepreneurs. Um, the biggest challenge that we are seeing for entrepreneurs though, is that the time to investment is much longer. Uh, the market has really reset around that. So I would say in 21, um, it was about speed. Like the, the entire market was about like speed to check deployment. You know, that time got really compressed. People were often doing one meeting and then committing. Um, so you're seeing rounds very often get done in days and weeks. That was just kind of normal. And people had uh, 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 accepted that. And that became like a, uh, like just standard practice. Um, and what we're seeing now is um, what's normal, what's common, what's um, sort of uh, uh, standard practice is for deals to take months. Um, and um, for uh, entrepreneurs and investors to both expect to, you know, meet with each other multiple times, diligence calls, revisiting, you know, like let's see another month of data before we commit. And, this is now the kind of the standard practice for uh, for funding. So my biggest feedback for uh, any entrepreneur fundraising in this environment is whatever expectation that you had in terms of how long it would take to get done, double it, triple it even. You know, if you were thinking about a one to two month process, you got to think about like a four to six month process. Um, wow. And it's just, these things just take longer. That's my number one advice. And I don't see that changing. Um, so I do think that, more deals will get done, the macro will improve, but mm -hmm. it's going to be slow deployments. People are just going to take their time. We've kind of settled into like the um, 
this being the 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 new normal. And uh, you know, maybe a huge bull run will get triggered at some point in the future that will like reaccelerate timelines again. But I'm just not seeing it in the next twelve to twenty four months. I think it will be People. very slow. So just prepare yeah. for that. That's my number one advice for any entrepreneur. Prepare for a, a longer process. Yeah, people are being extra cautious right now. That's right. That's right. Um, um, yeah, and then like um, some of the other tips that I, that I always like to share um, uh, is, uh, you know, going back to like the the, the GGV um, analysis that, you know, their best investments came, were correlated with how long they knew the team, the entrepreneur. You know, um, take the time to develop uh, relationships with investors even before you're actually fundraising. You know, the, there's this age old uh, adage that is uh, ask for uh, uh, money, you get advice, but if you ask for advice, you get money. So uh, constantly, <laughs> you know, be meeting with investors, getting feedback, developing the relationship so that you're not walking in cold off the street when you're ready to pitch. So that's a, a good best practice. And then uh, another one that I like to, to give is, um, uh, often people sort of um, not only they like radio silent with investors until like the moment they start fundraising, uh, uh, which I think is the wrong approach. Another wrong approach is when they start fundraising, they just blast and hit everyone all at once. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just like a big cattle call, just like I'm going to invite everyone to the party at the exact same time. And, you know, whoever <laughs> RSVPs is who I talk to. Uh, I think it's better to be selective about it and do it in waves and kind of be thoughtful mm -hmm. about who you construct and, um, and, and, reach out to different groups in, in, in different stages. And um, the number one benefit to doing that is it gives you time to adjust the pitch and listen to feedback. You might first meet with three investors and all three of them pass, but they give you something very concrete about why. And it turns out that's something that you can address. Maybe they had uh, they all had concerns about this competitor that they didn't think that, um, that you would be able to, to beat. Uh, but it turns out um, you actually have a very different approach to this competitor and you don't, you're not competitive at all. In fact, it's, um, it, it's, it's maybe um, uh, you could even partner with them because it's like very um, additive to their service. And you just need to do, do a good job explaining that in the pitch. You can, if you pause, you can take the time to digest that information, adjust the pitch, and then go back out to the next group of investors with, you know, the, the, the message uh, modified, but you can't do that if you just like send this blast out and meet with everyone all at once. So um, uh, two pieces of advice, Meet with people, not just at fundraising in terms of investors, but kind of throughout your time operating, uh, just take the time to develop the relationships. And then second, when you are fundraising, be selective uh, and do it in waves, do it in, 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 in sort of like these cohorts of people that you talk to so that you can digest the feedback and, and, and adjust the strategy based on what you're hearing. Great advice, Eric. Thank you very much. Tell us about some of your deals that you've done. Who are some of the companies that you've actually that have actually passed all this criteria? Yeah, we um, you know we love all our companies uh, uh, equally. Uh, they are all um, very uh, near and dear and precious. So I don't want to uh, lift up one uh, to uh, uh, sort of to um, to diminish any of the others. So this by no means is me trying to pick like my favorite child as well. But I will highlight just a couple of companies uh, that. Um, uh, are really topical right now because um, we actually did this um, uh, promotion with Brex uh, last uh -huh. week uh, in New York, and we had four of our portfolio companies that were um, uh, highlighted in Times Square on a big billboard in Times Square, which was so cool to see. Like we got it, it was for 24 hours at the top of the hour every hour. So, you know, at 6 p.m. on the dot four uh, gold house ventures portfolio companies got on the massive billboard in Times Square. And then at 7 p.m. it happened again, at 8 p.m. it happened again. It was just like so cool to see. So um, I just will highlight those four companies because, you know, it's just kind of very uh, top of mind. But um, the first one um, was an exciting new company called After Hour, which is uh, creating a new social network and community for investors. Um, it's taking the kind of the fun and community and the chat and all the conversation that happened inside Wall Street Bets on Reddit. And it's creating an entirely standalone app and company and service and product to make that even better. So imagine if Wall Street Bets got spun out from Reddit into a standalone company, what might it look like? And that's what After Hours is trying to build. And the founder happened to be uh, one of the biggest influencers inside of Wall Street Bets. So really understands that market and that community really well. Um, and we did that investment alongside uh, General Catalyst, one of our phenomenal co-investment partners. Um, so uh, that's one company. 
Another one uh, that we featured as part of this uh, Times Square promotion is called Finch. Uh, they are building an API layer for HR and payroll information. So right now there are 180 different systems that companies have to integrate in to get access to uh, HR and payroll data. And uh, to write all those customs integrations is impossible. So what um, Finch has done is aggregated that. They've created a single API that you can call. They've done all the hard work of doing all those integrations and they power this amazing SaaS service that allows um, you know, uh, all sorts of payroll providers, insurance providers to be able to access all their employment data through one API. Um, and uh, that company, we ended up investing with uh, Menlo, uh, one of our other great uh, co-investment partners. Um, another company that, that was featured is called Mercaso. They are mm -hmm. building, uh, uh, think of that as Instacart, like a grocery delivery service, but they're targeting small businesses. So um, uh, small businesses like laundromats, for example, which is a big customer group of theirs, um, they make a lot of their profits selling um, fast moving goods like soda and chips inside their physical locations. But uh, they typically have to, the owners have to drive to Costco and make those purchases manually. And it's just like a real pain in the butt to do so. So Mercaso is a business that you install an app, you can order online, they take care of delivery. Uh, and uh, all of a sudden you just get the products uh, uh, and they just arrive. And it's a much more convenient, easy experience for them uh, in order to get fast moving goods. And this is a company that's gone from uh, zero to more than 15 million of revenue in a year. Um, so growing incredibly fast. Um, and uh, we did that deal uh, alongside um, uh, North Zone and Jazz Ventures, two other of our mm -hmm. great products. And then uh, finally, um, uh, there's a, a last company that was featured is called uh, Tomo Credit. Um, they help uh, um, a lot of uh, uh, immigrants and um, uh, people new to this country uh, improve their credit score and develop uh, better credit through a, a, a smart credit card product that they've created. And in fact, a lot of their companies, uh, uh, sorry, a lot of their customers are Asian immigrants, which is an area, of course, that's near and dear to our hearts. So not only is it a, uh, an Asian founder, her name's Christy Kim, phenomenal founder, but uh, she's also targeting Asian customers. So it's sort of like really in our wheelhouse of supporting and uh, helping our uh, community. So that's a uh, uh, exciting one um, that um, we invested in alongside uh, Morgan Stanley um, and a bunch of other amazing funds. So um, I think the, the key thing to highlight here is a real diverse set of companies um, mm -hmm. that, that we work with. But uh, one, um, I think unifying constraint, in addition, of course, all of them had great uh, Asian and Pacific Islander founders, uh, but we invested alongside amazing funds at the same time. So uh, everything we do, uh, we call it investing as a team sport. Uh, we do it uh, alongside others that are part of this team that wants to support Gold House and the nonprofit and the, and the initiatives. Wow. Sounds so exciting. Uh, anyone else have another question? Any other questions lined up? Okay. okay. Looks like there's one in here. Um, okay, from, go ahead, Eric. Yeah, I was just going to read the most recent one. Um, okay. Like, uh, there's one about um, concerns when you see a young 24-year-old founder. Um, you know, <laughs> um, are there ways to get ahead of that or counterbalance? Um, um, yeah. Um, well, I, um, one of the things that I've always been really attracted to with um, entrepreneurship and investing is that, um, you know, th th there is the ability for it to be a meritocracy. You know, it's sort of, um, uh, uh, founders come in all different shapes, sizes, ages, demos, and, um, you know, everyone has a chance to build a great business. Um, so that's one of the things I love about entrepreneurship. Um, mm -hmm. so, um, for young founders, I, I, I don't necessarily think that there is a, um, a, any sort of bias against, um, you know, people are excited to work with young founders. Um, I think that maybe the concern is that young equals inexperienced, um, and I think that is a challenge because one thing that investors love um, is for founders to be proximate to their market, to be really close to the market, to really understand their market. Um, and the reason is that proximity gives them better insights into how to navigate that hopefully gives them an edge over other companies. So, you know, I'll just go back to the example of after hour, um, the, um, uh, the Wall Street bets as a standalone company uh, mm -hmm. idea. Um, I'm so excited by that, but I'm even more excited because of how proximate the founder Kevin is to that idea. He was a Wall Street bets whale. 
huge influencer, understands that community. So if anyone can think about making the right product decisions, the right positioning, uh, making the right strategic decisions, it's Kevin because he is yeah. so proximate and understands it. Um, yeah. There might be people that are older and more experienced about fintech than Kevin, but I'd rather back him because he knows that market better than anyone else. So um, I think this is important for every entrepreneur. Um, when you are talking to investors, it's not so much um, worrying about the age, but I do think that um, you do have to communicate experience and proximity to your market because that is something that investors really care about. Like, you know, I, I would much rather invest in a, um, you know, a younger entrepreneur that is close to the market than an older entrepreneur that doesn't understand the market. Or conversely, I'd rather invest in an old entrepreneur that understands the market than, you know, a young entrepreneur that doesn't. It, I think the proximity is the most important thing, the less so the actual age. Okay, very great answer. Okay, look, uh, about crowdfunding, there's a question about crowdfunding. There's also a question about your construction technology investment. Uh, which one do you want to answer first? Um, yeah, why don't we talk about crowdfunding? Um, so okay. one of the exciting things um, nowadays with um, fundraising is that there's just so many sources for it. Um, I, I like to give my old Kleiner partners, um, uh, the, the ones that, you know, from the previous generation of venture investing a hard time because it's like, you all had it so easy. Uh, you know, like 30 years ago, you're kind of the only game in town. So uh, any entrepreneur, they had to go down Sand Hill Road. Um, you know, it, it's, it's kind of crazy to think about now that there is this street, a single street, Sand Hill Road, where all the investors were, uh, they had offices on and you would only go there to fundraise. That was the only place. So everyone would have to make this pilgrimage to the Bay Area drive down to Sand Hill Road and fundraise at that one physical location because it was the only game in town for funding. Um, right. And to be on that street meant that you kind of, I, I joke, it was uh, it was Kaitan Sushi of investing. You just sat there as like a conveyor belt of entrepreneurs went by your table and you got to pick <laughs> off what you wanted. And, you know, investing was easy. Um, today, there's so many diverse forms of uh, and alternative forms to find capital, whether it's, um, of course, there's still the Sand Hill Road. It's a phenomenal place to go get, um, and raise capital, but there's a lot of angels. There's uh, corporate venture firms or strategic companies. Um, there's crowdfunding uh, with crypto. There was an entirely different type of funding with token issuance. Uh, but there are all these sources of funding, and um, that is to me a great positive thing for entrepreneurs because it shifts more control to entrepreneurs. It gives them more options. It gives them more chances to raise capital mm -hmm. and therefore build a successful company. So mm -hmm. I think that's nothing but positive. And my advice for um, which avenue to pursue is um, any of them and all of them. That's just the real- um, <laughs> Any and all of them? Yeah, any and uh, all. That's really yeah. my, my number one is just like, um, you know, uh, whatever it takes to raise capital, it you know, you should do it. Um, uh, I remember my, um, uh, uh, Eugene Kleiner, uh, one yeah. of the legendary investors and founder of Kleiner Perkins, he had this great saying, which was um, when they're passing out orders, take two. Uh, and that was really related to fundraising, which is like, <laughs> if there's a way to get capital, just grab it. If, if they're offering you more than you need, just take that too. Um, I, I kind of uh, riffed on that phrase. And I always like to tell uh, founders, um, raise more than you need, spend less than you raise. Um, that's like the magic formula to success. And therefore, um, uh, to raise more than you need. If, if it involves a couple of angels, some friends and family checks, maybe there's one institutional that comes in and then some crowdfunding and then you go through accelerator. Great. Do it all. Do whatever it yeah. takes to raise the capital. Um, because I can assure you uh, th th there's a, there's a million reasons why a company will succeed. And I can't predict that, M you know, maybe it's marketing conditions or, you know, some, some, you know, Kim Kardashian gets photographed with your product on the runway. And that's why it takes off. Like who knows? Um, there's a million reasons why a company can succeed, but um, there's one reason why a company will always fail. And that is if it does not have enough resources and it runs out of money. Like th th that is just like a, that is a uh, fatality rate of a hundred percent. So, um, you know, when it comes to avoiding that, that means that you just mm -hmm. need as much capital as you possibly can get, bring it all in. Uh, and uh, if it's from diverse sources, fantastic. That just is more options for you, but um, the, sort of, there's no money that's like, I, I'm above that source of capital. Like us, I'm not going to raise okay. from that angel. I'm not going to raise from that fund. I'm not going to raise right. from, you know, that, that crowdfunding platform. 
no, like um, raise as much as you can um, and just make sure you spend less on your raise, but uh, raise as much as you can because uh, that'll help you avoid the 100% fatality of rate of uh, running out of money. Yeah. And today there's a lot, quite a few more Sand Hill Roads spread across the country. That's right. So you can tap into those, like even from Indiana and Ohio. And and you should, that, all of you should check out Rebecca's book to understand uh, all those different markets. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you, Eric. <laughs> Silicon Heartland. That's right. Uh, one one of one of those uh, tech zones that's developing, uh, just that's like right. China did, just like China did, uh, but a little slower than China. <laughs> that's right. But I, I think this is like a continuing trend that we're going to see um, in terms of um, diverse capital sources all over the place, combined with another really interesting um, factor, which is um, less capital required to start companies, which I think okay. is a really interesting trend. So. Um, you know, when we when we started Hulu, um, we raised a seed round. You know, we formed this joint venture with Fox and uh, NBC, and eventually the Walt Disney Company came in. Um, but before we written the line of code, um, went out and raised a seed round in order to fund the operations. That seed round was a hundred million dollars um, from uh, Providence Equity Partners. Um, and um, yes, you know, we had the benefit of great content and these media partnerships that allow us to raise that round. But we also raised it because we expected to have to spend that much to get a video service off the ground. Um, we bought, you know, $5 million worth of hardware to launch Hulu. We had to buy physical servers and we had to put them in a data center and rack them ourselves. And then we had to fly out to Virginia and do it all over again because we needed bi-coastal redundancy. Um, and, um, you know, we had to get physical office space for everyone and expensive downtown Santa Monica because like, there were no tools to be able to coordinate and do things remotely. And we had all of these costs. So, um, you know, we, we had the benefit of being able to raise that capital, but we also had the kind of the, the disadvantage of having to raise all that capital to spend it. And then you think about a startup these days where you don't buy anything. You don't, you know, you lease a, uh, uh, you don't even deal with hardware. You deal with like a microservice that runs on some virtual machine that you lease a tiny percentage of for a few hours. That's it. And then, um, um, you know, all your people can be di remotely distributed and they can collaborate over great tools like, you know, Slack and Discord and use GitHub and use yeah. Trello and all these amazing tools. And um, what that's done is really driven down the cost of capital needed to start a company. So not only do you have diverse sources, but the checks that they have to write to get a company off the ground are smaller too. So I think those two things added together is going to continue this trend of, you um, iconic companies being created in sort of all sorts of diverse ways um, because of uh, this kind of double whammy benefit of more sources of capital and less capital needed. All right, great. Tell us about your own startup now, your AI blockchain explorer. Wow. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, good plug. Um, so we've started this company called Symbol. It's, uh, it's at symbol.xyz. And um, uh, it is in the crypto web three space. And uh, what we're trying to do is build a new way to look at the blockchain. So think of the blockchain as this distributed ledger or just like a database, a way to store information. Um, but when you look at it, it's kind of like looking at lines of matrix code. If you remember the matrix movie, there was just like symbols that were all on the screen. Often when I show people what is stored on chain, that's what it looks like. It just looks like transaction hashes, random numbers, some code that you have to sort through. And people are like, I have no idea what any of this is. So um, what we're hoping to do with Symbol is to create a new way to read the blockchain. So we process that data, we ingest it, we monitor it in real time. We then create aggregations and rankings and analysis of it. And then what we ultimately present to readers is something that we call human readable. Um, and we run it through a semi-supervised LLM to achieve that. So um, we want to take uh, all this blockchain data and it's you know growing every day, and we want to make it more understandable to people. And by doing so, we hope to make all of crypto and Web three more accessible to people. Um, and, and and the analogy that you know that it really inspires us that we love to refer back to is the early days of the internet. Um, they were actually it was started you know sort of as a research project where people were using terminal and TCP IP, and it was all command line and you know, you could do a lot of the same things in terms of like sharing information and communicating and chatting, but the people that could do that, they basically had to understand Unix. And it was a very small mm -hmm. population of, you know, kind of geeky engineers that could access the internet. And then, um, uh, 
Netscape came around and created the browser and made the browser mainstream. And all of a sudden, anyone could access the internet. And that's when things got super exciting. And I feel right. like we're at the similar inflection point with the blockchain where right now it's kind of just limited to a select small number of people that have to be very technically proficient to understand what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. And we're hoping for like that Netscape Navigator moment. What is that Netscape nav Navigator moment where the blockchain will be accessible to everyone? And um, that's what we're trying to build at Symbol. Uh, you know, uh, uh, knock on wood, maybe we get part of the way there. Maybe we get all the way there. Who knows? But we just want to be a part of that solution to make the blockchain more accessible. Okay. And also you're talking about this open access. The chat GPT with AI is the open access. Anyone can get on now, right? So yeah. it's a similar thing. Um with yeah, I mean, how the internet developed. Exactly. Per another perfect example. Thank you for, for bringing that up. Um, uh, GPT-4, or actually GPT-3, which is what ChatGPT first launched in, uh, was this large language model that was available. It had been around for years, uh, but in order to access it, you had to be an engineer. You had to get API access. You had to do it programmatically. And then um, Chat, uh, and then OpenAI decided like, you know what? Let's just lower the barrier so that anyone can access our large language model through something that they all understand, which is a chat interface. So they put a chat interface on top of GPT-3 and then GPT-4 uh, and called it ChatGPT. That's when things really exploded. So the core technology was the same, very, very similar uh, what you had two years before ChatGPT and what you had at the launch of ChatGPT, but the usage didn't happen until you made that technology accessible. Uh, and that's what they did. Okay. Do you think that that whole sector is overhyped or do you think that we're just at the beginning of the beginning? Um, I, I think, I think uh, both can be true. So uh, both can absolutely be true. Um, but what about in like vertical applications such as healthcare? And, you know, there is a healthcare question here too. So I'm kind of leaning that way, but yeah. what about AI and healthcare, AI and, you know, uh, you know, uh, financial fraud, these kinds of, and retail and that's right. Uh, industrial uh, manufacturing. Uh, That's right. All these, there's, yeah. there's no doubt that AI is a great implementation detail of an existing product. And what I mean by that is um, there are very few companies that were like, we sell you mobile or we sell you the internet. There, there are very few companies that, but what they, what great companies did was we sell you the solution that you can now access via mobile or access via the internet online. So that is an implementation detail that makes our solution so much better. Um, mm -hmm. So um, that's how I view a lot of the verticalized AI applications, or you know, they call them co-pilot applications. But um, yeah. I'm not selling you AI. I'm selling you this better diagnostic tool. I just happen to use AI because it's cheaper than um, you know having human review it, and you get data back immediately as opposed to having to wait 24 hours. And because right. of AI as my implementation detail, my product is now substantially better. I think that is a phenomenal right. trend. It absolutely will continue. Um, and, um, and we'll see a lot more of those companies emerge. Uh, I'm, and I think that that is real. The ones that are more hype and a little bit nervous are the ones that are, I'm actually just selling you general purpose AI. I am mm -hmm. technology looking for a problem to solve. Um, those are always challenging because uh, it usually takes a lot of money to build kind of general purpose things. And uh, I, I do question if startups are the best people to, to focus on like foundational general purpose technology, but uh, the startups that are taking that talk, the technology and using it really quickly uh, as implementation details, I think are going to build iconic businesses. Okay. Startups that can be specialized in how they apply AI. That's right. AI mm -hmm. is an implementation detail. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So do you think that the big, you think the big tech companies are going to be the winners here? I think they the will Google be the big winners. Products? There'll be the big winners of the uh, infrastructure and the foundational language models and the foundational technology. Yes, I do believe that. It's like um, sort of all the internet, um, all internet traffic flows through networking equipment that something like four or five companies build. That's it. I see. But that doesn't mean that those companies captured all the value of the internet. They just happen to enable the base layer of communication and the communication protocol. But there's a lot of companies, startups, small companies that built on top of that and made incredibly successful businesses. So I think that will repeat itself with AI as well. Okay. What about um, another technology here uh, besides the metaverse, which I want to ask you about, but somebody has a question about e-cigarette technology. Oh boy. Uh <laughs> yeah. You know, um, uh, that's a tough one in that 
there's potential for a lot of good there in terms of like, um, it's almost like an off ramp to cigarette smoking. Like traditional cigarettes are clearly less healthy than e-cigarettes. So if it was a form of cessation, you know, like a, a, a nicotine patch that kind of wean people off of traditional yeah. tar-based mm. cigarettes on the e-cigarettes, I think that's a good thing for the world. And it's, um, and it's something that everyone should be excited to, to support and, uh, and have happen. But I think the challenge is that it's unclear if that's actually how it's used. Um, if it's actually used as cessation or if it's actually encouraging more people to smoke I because- see. Uh, people are like, oh, it's not as dangerous. So I'm just going to go in and use uh, an e-cig. So um, I think the cessation uh, um, uh, goal and mission is very noble and something that I, I'm personally a supporter of. And I hope that um, sure. um, it can happen. But the idea that uh, an e-cig could actually increase smoking, I think, is a, a problem right. and a net detriment to society. Okay, Right. So you've already answered the question about how does somebody reach you? So, um, but I also just want to um, say a few extra words about what yeah. we have coming up on the show. Of course. So, and also just thank Eric for his time because we're almost running out of time here. Thank you everyone for your great questions. And uh, thank you, Eric, for your great advice. Um, so look, uh, our next show is going to be coming up pretty soon. And um, yeah, let me just uh, go to the screen and share with you who's coming up next. Um, so we have Kelvin Aw from Cell Capital of London. Do you know him, Eric? I don't know him. Okay, well, tune in and, and I uh, meet I absolutely him. will. Okay, and then after that, we have Elisa Lee from Bessemer Ventures. Uh, Bessemer Ventures, the Silicon Valley venture firm. Uh, oh. She's now in Hong Kong. Do you know her? I, I know of, I know of, so. Do you know of, okay. Yes. Uh, so those two are coming up uh, very soon, and I hope that you'll uh, that everyone will tune in. And uh, we have our membership program. If you don't want to join uh, Jeff's, um, I mean Eric's uh, membership program, which sounds great, you can always join the circle uh, and check out what we're doing. And uh, look, I just think uh, Eric did a phenomenal job and uh, really helped uh, to uh, speed the program along. And I can't believe we're almost at uh, the ending hour now. Uh, anything else you'd like to say, Eric? Uh, no, I just want to thank you, Rebecca, for having me on. It's always great to get to catch up with you. It's, you know, we've known each other for many years now. So always fun yeah. to check back in and so excited yeah. by all the great things that you've been focused on and working on. And uh, thank you everyone that joined in. Hope it was helpful. And for all the entrepreneurs out there, um, uh, keep building. Um, you know, yeah. uh, uh, I'm just entrepreneurship creates half of new jobs in this country, creates breakthrough products and services that we all depend on and use. It has a chance to be transformative and make the world better for all of us. So whatever it is you're working on, please keep at it and uh, uh, persist, um, you know, uh, uh, keep pushing forward. It, you know, it's no one said that this was easy, but just because it's hard doesn't mean it's not incredibly rewarding. Um, so Definitely keep pushing forward. And uh, Rebecca, for you, uh, safe travels. Uh, I, yeah. I hear you're going to Asia for the first time since the pandemic. So uh, safe travels out there. Thank you very much. You take care. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.